video, we're going to talk about disease. More specifically, we're going to talk about infectious disease and how pathogens can cause infectious disease. But if we talk about disease itself, there's obviously two kind of diseases that jump into mind. There's non-infectious and there's infectious. And just because it's called non-infectious, that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. But there are some differences in terms of how we can classify them either as non-infectious or infectious. For example, non-infectious diseases are non-contagious, which means we can't catch them. And also, they're not caused by pathogen. And we'll go over that word pathogen in a second. Whereas infectious diseases, they are contagious, which means we can catch them. And they are caused by pathogen, right? These are basically the big differences between the two. But um, the actual non-infectious diseases can cause, are caused by different factors, right? They are caused by, for example, environmental or lifestyle factors. One example would be the heart disease. Right? It's caused by smoking too much, by having a non-balanced diet, by not doing enough exercise over a lifetime plus genetic factors, these can give you heart disease. It's, that's why it's non-infectious. It's not giving you for you for an infection. Also, nutrition deficiencies could also be a cause, such as, for example, scurvy. Scurvy is when your teeth fall out. But uh, this is not caused by virus or a pathogen, but by just not having enough vitamin C. And it could also be genetic reasons, such as Down syndrome. It's basically when you have a chromosome too much, and that can give you Down syndrome, so it's genetic. Whereas infectious diseases are contagious, as I mentioned earlier, and they're caused by pathogen. For example, the common cold would be one that most of you would have had by, at some stage, right? It's, it's not dangerous, it's not problematic, but it's caused by virus. The athlete's foot, again, some of you might have had that. It's not dangerous, it doesn't really hurt too much. It's caused by fungi. Um, malaria, this is quite deadly, and it's actually a, a very deadly disease in mo many parts of sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see this graph here shows how many millions of people have died. So from malaria itself, we've got on a yearly basis, we've got more than a million people that have died in 1998. Most of them were actually under five, so most of them were children. And infectious diseases still kill a lot of people. They used to kill more people, but they still kill a lot of people, especially in the developing countries. Um, malaria is a huge problem, and it's caused by protozoa. And we've got tuberculosis. This used to be a huge problem, but now we've gotten... Um, methods to prevent it from occurring. Tuberculosis is a bacterial infection. Right? So all these ones I mentioned earlier are contagious and are caused by a pathogen. Therefore, they fall into the category of infectious. And that's the ones we're going to talk about a bit more now. But I might ask you, well, what is a pathogen? And you might think, well, prions, bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, macroparasites, all of these would be examples of pathogens, which you are correct. There you are uh, partially correct. But the thing is, we actually have, so we have more microbes in or on our body, then we have human cells. So we have more microbes than human cells living in or on our body. And obviously not, not all of those ones are causing diseases or problems, which means they're not all of them are actually classified as pathogens. So I'll go over the definition of a pathogen in a second. Right? So obviously we've got lots of good skin microflora. Microflora is just a group of, of microbes, so some very microscopic little animals that help protect us. So microflora, if it's a healthy microflora, then we would have protection against infection, right? And if we look at our skin, if we were to look at our skin under the microscope, we would be able to see a lot of these different types of microbes on our skin, right? But at the same time, we obviously see things like pimples. Most of you would have gotten a pimple at some stage, and that would be an example of a bacterial infection. So this would be a microbe that has caused a disease. In this case, a pimple would be classified as, as a disease, right? So we have some bacteria which seem to be good, right? They protect us, whereas other bacteria cause problems that cause disease. And this is one of the big differences in terms of definition between just a normal microbe and a pathogen. Because these are the three things that they need to be able to get the tick off to be a pathogen, right? First of all, they must be able to live on or in us. We are its host, right? So again, all of these microbes living on our skin, they would all live in or on us. So they're all not yet pathogens, right? Because there's more to than just living on us. But then you have to be able to live in or on us. They also must be able to reproduce in or on us. They must be able to have offspring, more and more, make more and more of them. Otherwise, they can't cause disease. And the last one, the most important one, is they must be able to cause disease. So for, if they get all these three ticks, then they're called a pathogen. And if we, for example, look at our skin, most of our skin microflora, so most, most microbes on our skin would not be pathogens. But the one that the microbe that causes pimples, it would tick all those three, and thereby it would be a pathogen. Right? So each of these classes of microbes or of macroparasites in a microbe, but each of these would be having some, some of them would be pathogenic, some bacteria would be pathogens, but not all of them, right? So some, all viruses are actually pathogenic, but some of these would not be pathogenic. If they take all three, they would.
some examples of bacteria would be, some examples of bacteria would not be. Right. But if we have if we have so many microbes all around us, how could we see those microbes? What could we do to see those microbes? And what we can actually, oh, obviously, the easiest way would be to just grab a microphone, not a microphone, but a microscope, and look under the microscope from a sample of water, for example, or a sample of yogurt. I might grab some food or some water, put it in the microscope, and we can see those actual microbes. But if we don't have a microscope, what could we, else could we do? Well, we can do something called the agar plate technique. What the agar plate is, is a medium for growth. It's basically got nutrients on it, food for the bacteria, and if we put bacteria on it and leave it standing in a warm condition, it will grow. Right? So the idea would be just first of all to grab on its agar plate, right? grab a inoculating loop, which is just a utensil used to, or a equipment used to put your bacteria onto the agar plate. So use the inoculating loop, put your sample on it, either your water or yogurt sample, and make an S-shaped sort of pattern onto that inoculating onto that agar plate. Make sure before you use your actual an inoculating loop, make sure you sterilize it. It needs to be clean, right? And you want to make sure you do this as fast as possible to make sure you don't get any pathogens onto the actual agar plate. When you open the agar plate, put, make it as fast as possible, close them, and then keep them sealed. Right? So once you've done it, once you've put your inoculated, which means you put your microbes onto, or your sample onto the actual agar plate, the water or yogurt sample, what you do is you seal it, you put it in a warm area, and you just leave it standing for a while. And then a couple of days later you come and you observe what happened. If there's lots of growth that has happened, that means originally in the original sample, there have been lots of pathogens in that sample. So that's, how, that's the way we can actually make all those microbes visible. And we've done this in the past. Agar plate was developed by Robert Koch. We've done this a lot in the past. And we now know that microbes are literally everywhere, right? So on our skin, food, uh, in water, and we also know that some of these microbes can cause disease. Remember that was a pathogen. So before we knew all this, so before we knew all this, well, we had no attention to cleanliness. We weren't clean or anything because we didn't think it was important. And we didn't even sterilize our equipment. So we didn't make sure our equipment was pathogen free. So what that meant is often people will die in a hospital, not because of an infection they got from outside of the hospital, but because surgeons were using equipment that was not cleaned and they would actually get those pathogens from that equipment and then they would also fall sick. Right, so now we know we need to be clean, we need to sterilize equipment, we need to generally have good practices to make sure pathogens don't spread from one place to the next. And when it comes to food practices, you often see when you're in a kitchen, you might see people with these hats on or wearing gloves. That's basically standard practice, right? And that makes sure that the pathogens don't go from the skin onto food because otherwise they might end up in someone else's mouth and then they might get disease. Um, we make sure we refrigerate food because we know there's pathogens in the air that will land up on the food. And if we don't put them in a cold environment, they might grow on that food. We know we should wash our hands when we're dealing with food because that makes sure we can get all any pathogens that might be problematic off our skin. Right? Also, we make sure we have good personal hygiene. Personal hygiene refers to what you're doing on a daily basis to keep yourself clean. Right? So for example, you're not meant to be coughing in someone's face. You're meant to be using tissue paper and then dispose of that tissue paper, right? So use tissue to make sure you don't spread your disease. Take regular showers to make sure you kill any pathogens that might be on you. Wash your hands, especially after toilet, etc. And brush your teeth. All these would be examples of what we can do to make sure we don't have any pathogens on us. Also, when it comes to water practices, uh, I mentioned earlier that, for example, malaria, not malaria, but the other diseases, many diseases that affect young children, many times in developing countries, and many times it's due to water being having lots of pathogen in them, and then they, these kids might drink the water or play in the water, and then they will get the, the actual pathogens from that water. So a couple of things we can do to make sure we have less pathogens in water. First of all, we often boil our water, especially when drinking it, before drinking it. We nowadays have sewage treatment plants to make sure we remove any sewage we would otherwise put into the water. And we also treat drinking water through these um, water drinking plants, which make sure that the water that comes out of the tap is nice and clean. These are all these methods I mentioned earlier, are things that we now do to make sure we don't spread pathogens because these pathogens cause disease. And when it comes to, I want to go a bit, go more into detail in terms of how we um, treat our drinking water. There's two ways. We'll either boil our water or we'll put it through a water treatment plant. And the reason why is because in water there might be solids, either dissolved or suspended. So it might be the solid particles. Because remember where water comes from originally, they might come from a lake or from a river. And then in that lake or river, there are going to be some soil particles or pathogens inside that river. And we need to get rid of that actual, um, those particles, those pathogens before they enter our tap, our drinking water. So inside that water, it might be solids or pathogens. So by, for example, boiling that water before we drink it, 
that a high temperature will actually denature some enzymes of pathogens, thereby killing them, or the high temperature might directly kill the pathogens. But in either case, basically boiling water is going to make the water safer to drink. Right? And that boiling water we often call pasteurization, because that was developed. That technique was developed by Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, um, to kill microbes. Right, another way is these water treatment plants, and there's basically four stages, and they make sure that in this case all the solids and all the pathogens or the vast majority of them will be removed from the water. The first one is a stage of coagulation, which is right here. We've got a coagulant added to that water, and what it does is it makes all the solids clump together. Then the next stage is sedimentation. So when all of these solids have clumped together, they are removed because they drop to the bottom of the tank and they're removed from that actual tank. So now we've removed most of our solids for the first two stages. Filtration is the next stage. Here we've got fine filters that remove any leftover fine particles. And then the last stage is disinfection. Here we add some chlorine and this chlorine will kill any remaining pathogens. So by these four steps we've removed most of the solids and removed most of the pathogens and now we can drink that water. So now it's clean to drink. But this was just this video was just an introduction to the second context point of the search for better health module. Hopefully it gave you kind of an insight in terms of what will be coming up next, the next couple of videos. Hopefully that was useful.